Wayne Blake is a graduate of Free Hardeman University, graduate of Spring Bible Institute. He's preached full time for 12 years, part time for 20 years. You're not that old. How can you? You must have started off very, very young. He's worked with youth camps in Texas, Louisiana. He spoke on lectureships in Texas, Tennessee, Louisiana, Florida. Married to wife Laura, daughter Jenna. Currently attending the Fish Hatchery Road Congregation in Huntsville, Texas. And uh, I believe, are you still with the uh, Department of, what is it called these days? They change it every few years, don't they? Department of Corrections, Criminal Justice. So we talked about John West last night. If you break the law, he gets you. And then after he's through with you, Wayne gets you. So. <laughs> It occurs to me that there is a, a comparison here that can be made too. It was mentioned this morning, somebody said that the, the uh, apple doesn't fall too far from the tree. And in Wayne's clay, case, I'm glad that's so. Come talk to us, Wayne. I don't work around convicts, I work around computers. Therefore, once they're in, they may, I make sure they don't get out. <laughs> One of the most obvious changes in the religious world today is how the church is organized in its work. And what we're going to discuss this, uh, this, uh, this few moments is uh, what is the organization and work of the local church or the New Testament church? We first want to look at what the purpose or the mission and nature of the New Testament church is. In 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning of verse 5, it says, Ye also, as living stones are built up in a spiritual house and holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And in these verses we see, verse uh, 5 and verse 9, the characteristic of God's people. Christians are living sacrifices, are living stones. In other words, they're not dead. They're active. They're doing something. Uh, Christians are holy or they're a royal priesthood. They are a people for God's own possession meaning there is no laity group. They are given to uh, active service. Christians are of great value because Jesus died for them. Christians are brought with a price, and therefore we need to know of this very basic idea. The responsibility of the church as a whole and as individuals is to offer spiritual sacrifices. In Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, particularly in verse 1, he says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. We are to show forth his praises, meaning that we are showing others just what God has done for all of us and what he can do for others. In the Old Testament, this idea is nothing new, because in Isaiah 44, verse 23, it says, Sing ye, O heavens. For the Lord hath done it. Shout, ye lower parts of the earth. Break forth into singing, ye mountains, O forest, and every tree therein. For the Lord hath redeemed Jacob and glorified himself in Israel. In Matthew chapter 5 and verse 16, we are told in the New Testament to let our lights shine before men, that they may see our good works. In both of these verses, we see that God's people have a responsibility not to uh, only obey God, but to also set an example for the world by giving honor and praise to their creator by their words and their deeds. So we demonstrate the mission or the purpose of the church by the things that we do. We classify this service under three different things, edification, benevolence, and evangelism. We're not going to read all these verses, but I'm going to make 
pull some parts out of each. But uh, in the book, we're going to begin there in 2 Peter chapter 1. But particularly verse 3, he says, According to his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who hath called us to glory and virtue. Then we go down to verse 5, and it says, and Besides all this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to your virtue knowledge, to your knowledge temperance, uh, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make, that make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful, in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Secondly, Ephesians 4, verse 11 and 12. And he gave some to be apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Galatians 4, and verse 4. Recounting to us the, purp the purpose, uh, the reason that we are God's children. It says in verse 5, it says, To redeem them that are under the law, that you might receive the adoption of saints. And because ye are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. And then in Galatians, Acts chapter 10, in verse 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power. And it speaks about Jesus. It says that he went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. For God was with him. Galatians 6 and verse 10. We are commanded to go as we have opportunity. Let every one of us do good unto all men. And especially those of the household of faith. Mark 1 and verse 14. Uh, through, through, uh, through verse 22. But particularly verse uh, four, uh, 16 and 17. We see here Jesus coming along and walking along. He sees Simon and Andrew. And as they're going along, he makes them fishers. In other words, he calls them to follow him. But then he goes on and sees James and John. And the idea is that the call is there for all of us. The call is there for any who want to follow Jesus. Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 and 19. But particularly verse 19, the command of Jesus is, As you are going, or go ye therefore... And teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Ghost. Now, the point of showing this is that these verses clearly show us the three avenues whereby the work of the church is. And that is edification, benevolence, and evangelism. So we ask a question. Where is the authority for gyms, for confessionals, bingo parlors, women elders, or preachers? cake, cookie, or rummage sales, or any other myriad of acceptable things that the religious world has to offer today, you don't find it in the Word of God. If you don't find it there, it's something that Christians, God's people, are not to be a part of. We don't have the authority for it. The, th the, script, the, the church has three main functions, as is outlined in Scripture, and that's it. So we want to look now at the universal priesthood. We so call this in the sense because the universal priesthood means there's universal. It's all any who are children of God are priests. And we're going to look at that. From a practical standpoint, a priest in the Old Testament was a go-between or a mediator between God and man. Man could not go before God because man had a sin problem. Therefore, he would go to the priest, they would offer sacrifices, and the sacrifices then, and then the priest would go before God on behalf of the people. The high priest served at the temple. He entered into the Holy of Holies, where God dwelt, Leviticus chapter 16. And in his work, he would, da he would daily sacrifice a meal offering. And then once a year, as you know, he would offer the, the sacrifice that he would go into the Holy of Holies and sprinkle blood upon the altar and all those things. They would send the scapegoat out for the, uh, representing the sins of the people being let out. All these things are done through the Old Testament. Well, in the New Testament, we then learn the concept that Jesus himself was the high priest. 
and for all that are under the Christian dispensation. And therefore, Christians today are priests. And therefore, we have access to God. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 18 through 23. We are called the kingdom of priests. 1 Peter 2, verse 5 and 9. Revelation 5, verse 10. We do not have a group like the Levites under the Old Testament who have to go to God through access through someone else. We don't have that. We are priests. We have the ability to go to God on our own behalf. The disciples in Acts chapter 8, verse 1 and following, they were under heavy persecution. And it says about them in verse 4, it says they were scattered abroad everywhere. And it says they went everywhere preaching the word. And by this we see that the disciples then were scattering. And as they went, they preached and taught the gospel far and wide. They didn't need a priest to do this for them. They themselves did this, did it for themselves. <clears throat> the concept of individuals sharing the gospel is, a, is based upon the term universal priesthood. In our brotherhood, personal work is one of the things that we all are to be involved in as part of our obedience to God and his word. All nations cannot be reached by public proclaimers. And I think that needs to be, we're going to talk about it a little bit, but more and more, this mindset that whenever we hire a preacher, that's our evangelist, he's going to take care of it. we got to get away from that. That evangelist is there to train us, to help us, to prepare us, to get us ready to go out and do those things. But you know, that preacher can't evangelize the whole world. And that's exactly the, the design and purpose of the universal priesthood. That is given to each and every one of us as we prepare ourselves to, as we are going to preach the gospel. We all must make a choice to be like Christ in our willingness to teach and preach the gospel, Matthew 10 and verse 25. So let's look at the organization of the New Testament church. God is a God of order, not of one of confusion. But yet if you look out in our world today, you would think that God loves confusion. Because you have everything going on out here and everybody calling it something that God blesses. But God is not a God of confusion. Nearly all agree that the church has some kind of organization. In other words, the religious world as a whole believes that there is some type of organization. But where do we go to approach the question of an organization? Well, some would say, go ask the priest. Some would say, go ask the pope. Some would say, whatever. But if we're going to do things God's way, then we need to ask God. God, why do you want these things organized? There are synods, councils, that use nothing more than man's judgment. But the truth seeker, one who is trying to do things the way God wants them done, will remember that this is the Lord's church, not someone else's. Therefore, Jesus is the head. He is the Lord, and we must obey him. Ephesians 1, verse 22 and following. We are to understand that Jesus is the authority and the final authority. We can't make up our own rules. We've got to do it God's way. Jesus told us plainly that human tradition makes our worship vain. Matthew chapter 5, verse 9, 15 and verse 9. So, with this in mind, we need to respect Jesus as the final authority. Jesus promised that the Holy Spirit would guide the apostles, and he did, and he came as he was promised. John chapter 14 and verse 26, Acts chapter 2, verse 1 and following. He commanded the apostles to go and preach as they went throughout the whole world, Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 and following. And with that in mind, then, we know that the apostles preached and wrote with authority. Because they were commanded and told that the Holy Spirit would guide them in all truth. So if they wrote th those things down, it came from God. Well, we now have the written record, which in and of itself is authoritative. The New Testament contains the authority of Jesus, which must be followed until he returns. So as we think about this, then we must realize that the Bible teaches that the church is comprised of individual, local, independent congregation. 
There is no central earthly headquarters. Those who lead each co local congregation are called elders, who meet qualifications that have been set forth by the scriptures and no other book. 1 Timothy 3, Titus 1, Philippians 4, verse 9. And with the Bible being our authority and no other book, then everything else is unacceptable. So let's look at the organization of the local church. You know, we need to remember, as we've already pointed out, all Christians are priests. So the offices within the local church are designed, designated works and functions. They are specific positions, those being pastors, teachers, bishops, deacons. The list goes on to Acts, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, Philippians 1 and verse 1. And the New Testament organization is simple. Each local congregation is led by a group of men, a plurality, called presbyters, bishops, pastors. There, there are also others who are in the leadership roles, and they are called deacons. An evangelist. And we're going to get into talking about each one of these specifically. It's interesting to see that Timothy was an evangelist, but he was not a pastor or a presbyter. Peter was an evangelist as well as an elder in the first century church. And these examples show that in each church, there are those men who led and held offices requiring different qualifications and duties. Many people today are influenced by recent history of the church than by the Bible. Paul warned the departures that would come even while he was writing the very things he was writing. The departures were there. Uh, Acts chapter 20, verse 28 and following. 1, Peter, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 and 3. 2 Timothy 4, verse 3 and 4. The apostasy changed everything, including the, the organization of the church. The most notable of changes came in the leadership, and in particular, in the eldership. By as early as 110 A.D., there was already a bishop who was over a group of churches. Then the term elder was almost completely done away with, and entirely, and the word bishop was used exclusively. The bishops were, uh, began organizing synods, college of bishops, who then began to vote on laws for the church by as early as 300 A.D. And not long after, bishops of one city began to reside over other cities. Then a bishop of Rome, who had absolute power over all the churches in that area and in that, that whole Christendom, came into office by as early as the years 590 to 603 A.D. All of this shows a gradual departure from the original New Testament church. Now let's look at the individuals in the leadership itself. First of all, evangelists. You know, in the past decade, some leaders held to the evangelistic oversight concept. And basically what that is, is when an evangelist has the authority in a congregation that he planted to have absolute authority he told that congregation what it what for and did everything himself until maybe one time would come where they might have qualified uh, men who could be elders. And this, I, I'm going to say very clearly, is not the focus of what we're dealing with here today. Uh, but a question needs to be asked with that in mind. Is the evangelist a principal administrator of the local congregation? Because I think, sadly, a lot of our brethren need to ask that question and answer it honestly. Because some of our brethren, uh, if you preach for any time, you know this. How many times have you been called pastor? And even by some people who are members of the church. I, I mean, I understand it. I'm out here on the street and somebody stops me and calls me reverend or something. I understand the ignorance there. But I don't understand it from my brethren when they're calling me reverend and pastor and all those kind of things. They're not doing it in a joking way. They're doing it seriously. They're talking to you like that. So does the evangelist, is he the administrator of a local congregation? The role of an evangelist is addressed in the books of Timothy and Titus 
pretty specifically more than any other parts of the Bible. Timothy and Titus were men to whom we were introduced to in the book of Acts, Timothy, and then Titus, in the, as we see in the Titus. Later books that bear the name were written uh, specifically to them regarding their roles in the planning and the establishing of congregations in the first century. Timothy accompanied Paul through Asia Minor and into Macedonia, where he was left at Berea, while Paul traveled on to Athens, from which city he sent for Timothy and Silas, Acts chapter 17. Afterward, he sent Timothy to Thessalonica to encourage the brethren there and to hear about the welfare of the Thessalonian brethren. The Bible shows that Timothy was well received and needed in the work of the, these, uh, this work as well as the local evangelistic efforts. Titus is never mentioned in the book of Acts, but in, it is mentioned by Paul in his epistles. Titus, as we know, was a man. He was a Greek. Uh, he, he had Greek parents. He was probably converted by Paul. We read about him on the third missionary journey. And he is sent by Paul from Ephesus to Corinth and various other places. Uh, Titus 1, verse 4, 2 Corinthians 7, uh, and also chapter 8. Timothy and Titus were very close to the Apostle Paul. And, and, listen, to what, and listen to the point I'm trying to make here. Timothy and Titus were very close to the Apostle Paul. And if any of the evangelists of the New Testament ever enjoyed a position of confidence and trust, it was these two. Therefore, if there is any difference in an evangelist today and those two men, the balance would tip in their favor. You get what I'm getting at here? In other words, how, where do we look to find what an evangelist does? We look to the Word of God. Well, who would we look to? Well, Titus and Timothy. They were evangelists. So we want to know what an evangelist does. Look to their life. See what they did. Well, um, it would tip in their favor as one having more authority or ample power or influence because of their association with Paul. So therefore, it's needful to investigate the role played in the local congregation or congregations at the point in, which the, in, in, in the selection of Timothy. Paul is one who was endowed with the miraculous, uh, miraculous and able to give spiritual gifts to others by the laying on of his hands. In Acts chapter 6, the people of the congregation selected the men to be appointed. And that's a very important point. The people of the congregation selected the men to be appointed. In Acts chapter 13 and verse 1 and following, the Holy Spirit reveals his plans to Paul and Barnabas through the prophet um, or prophets of a local congregation rather than to Paul and Barnabas directly. And similarly, in the case of Timothy as an evangelist, the initiative rested not with Paul but with the local congregation, being Lystra and Iconium. Paul simply accepted their evaluation and after receiving a prophetic confirmation, acted in accordance to it. This shows a very important point. This shows that even the apostles had great respect for the autonomy of the local congregation and its work. And I think that's very important for us to point out here as we proceed. And so since the selection of the men in Acts 6 was done in collaboration, collaboration with the local congregation, rather than imposing something on her, it would be absurd to think that Timothy or Titus would be any different unless they were commanded in very explicit terms. So one would normally expect the laying on of hands which Timothy was to do and the appointing of elders which Titus was to accomplish in Crete was to be done in collaboration with the local congregation rather than as, elder, as rulers over them. And the point is they worked with them and ultimately in the end they would install them but the congregation would be involved in the selecting of these men. The mission of Timothy and Titus is seen in the work that was assigned to them. In 2 Timothy 4, in 1 Timothy 4, verse 13 and 15, Timothy is commanded to give himself to, not just in part, but wholly to the work. 
They were to do the work in regards in, to preaching and public proclamation of the word. He must be prepared to correct, rebuke, exhort the brethren with great patience and careful instruction. The evangelist had the duty, first of all, to preach the word and then correct those who did not follow the word and even rebuke those who attempted to undermine the words that were being spoken. He was also to encourage with gentleness the Christians to follow the word without being discouraged. He was also to devote himself to public reading and teaching of the word. The gospel message as Paul present, it presents in these epistles was clearly a perfect one. And the good minister had a duty of presenting it without the slightest change. He was to be a good minister only if he continued to warn the brethren of the grave danger of departing from the word. In addition to these functions, we also see in the first century the evangelists had still another. After Christians in given congregations had attained a certain maturity, he was then to help them, assist them in straightening out that which was left unfinished and in appointing elders, Titus 1 and verse 5. However, it would seem that Timothy and Titus did not select these elders or the deacons, in the various congregations, unilaterally, as some would possibly say. It seems almost certain that they followed the example of the apostles in this matter by asking the people of the congregation to search out those men who were qualified and they simply coordinated the selection process for which they would call an what we might call an installation ceremony. The word ordain or appoint just simply means uh, is also the same word which describes the apostles' actions in Acts 6, where it is certain that selection was left to the congregation. Now let's look at elders. I narrowed this down. I know we got a lot of problems right now in dealing with elders, reformation, those kinds of things. I didn't go into all that. I just tried to stay with this, particularly... If I didn't, it would have turned out to be more than 14 pages. So I narrowed this down. I want to look specifically at what the role of an elder is. When leading and directing is spoken of or alluded to in these epistles, it is always connected with elders or shepherds, not the evangelist. In fact, it is the person who serves in the office of an elder who is called the overseer, 1 Timothy 3 and verse 1. Also, it is the body of elders who direct the affairs of the church and who are to take care of God's church, 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17, chapter 3, and verse 5. And it is interesting to note that while the evangelist can be young and therefore inexperienced, those who direct the congregation must be elders and have a certain experience because of their age. Titus chapter 1, verse 5, 1 Timothy 3, and verse 6. It seems that because of their superior responsibility, they must be protected from false accusations in every deliberate manner, in, very, in a very deliberate manner. Whereas nothing of this nature is said of the evangelist. 1 Timothy 5 and verse 19. Now the elders are called overseers, but Timothy and Titus were never described in such a way. And to look into the denominational world today, you would think, that elders, bishops, pastors, shepherds, overseers, presbyters are just simply different people with the pastor being the evangelist. But the Bible is clear that all these words describe a work that is done by a plurality of men who are authorized by God to rule the local congregation. Ephesians 4 verse 11, Acts 14, chapter 20 verse 17 and following, the list goes on. Elders are men who have met the qualifications set forth by the word of God. And they are not a group of women. They're not a group of children or anyone else the denominational world would appoint to these duties. Let's look at deacons. The final link, link for church discipline, uh, government to be complete calls for the appointment of certain men to the office of deacon. This is another area where the world has defined and changed the qualifications that Holy Writ has given in very simple terms. There's a man that I work with. Um, 
He's about 10 years younger than me, I guess. And he's a deacon at uh, the old congregation that he attends, which is the Baptist church. He was married, but he had no children. And he and I got in discussion about that one day because he told me, I'm a deacon. And I said, oh, you are. How old are your children? He said, I don't have any children. Oh, okay. I said, so this is the way that your church does things. In other words, just find people that can lead. and It doesn't matter. I asked him, I said, what about what the Bible says? I read the passage. We got the Bible out and talked about it a few minutes. He didn't like what I had to say. He now has children. He adopted two children, and he came to me not long after he adopted and said, see, now I can be a deacon. I said, yeah, but you couldn't be one before. That's my point. And I said, because that's what the God's word says. Well, I need to say, he and I don't talk a lot of Bible. We just don't, because he gets very upset with me. Because I don't just answer him, I think I suppose. I say, let's look at what the Bible says. You say you believe in the Bible, let's read what the Bible says. And you do upset a lot of people when you want to read just from the Bible. And I don't understand that among religious people that say they love God. What's so scary about reading from the word of God? And what's so scary about following what God commands us to do? These men are appointed as servants. A special office presented to us through Holy Writ. And they are... They are appointed to serve the congregation under the guidance of the elders who serve also. They relieve the elders of mundane and routine affairs of the church. The apostles brought the church together. They set up qualifications for them, and they gave the number of men, and they made the appointments in Acts chapter 6. I know some may dispute whether those are deacons. I, I have no problem calling them deacons, but I do say this. Whether they could be described as deacons in the, in the biblical sense, they still were set aside to do a service, a work. And that's the principle that we're going by as we read through these passages. These men are set aside to do a particular work. The qualifications given for the deacons are listed in 1 Timothy 3, verse 8 and following. The qualifications and requirements of this group of men would point to the type of person who would eventually become an elder. But this is not necessarily the case. And I say that because I have no problem with the idea of someone being a deacon and maybe looking forward to the day when they could become an elder. But you know... Some men can be qualified to be deacons, but they can't be qualified to be elders. And we need to understand that fact. And this idea of a deacon as an elder in training, that, that's, that's sadly a thing that needs to be put away. Because sometimes deacons will always be deacons. They can never be an elder. They are as deacons, in fact, like the rest of the, of the membership. And that they are to obey and execute their task in such a manner as to give joy to the elders. Hebrews 13 and verse 17. The group of seven men that were appointed in Acts 6 were selected to engage in a daily ministration. The congregation agreed upon the people. They served the widows and rendered active service towards solving problems that had developed. We understand this to be a distinct office in the church. They were appointed a task to serve. This office, along with the eldership, is in such need today as we see the church needing good, godly leaders and those who seek to fulfill their obligation to the best of their abilities. You know, when we look to the scriptures with a good and honest heart, and we look to the qualifications of an evangelist. We see that an evangelist, there is specific need for evangelists, and we need them. 
but they are not the people who run the local congregation. The elders are to do that. And the elders, if men are able, also choose deacons. The congregation will choose deacons to work and help the elders succeed at their work. And if all these come together and work the way God wants to do, we'll be the New Testament church. But if we begin to add and subtract and make any variation of this, then we cease to be the New Testament church. That's the purpose of this lectureship, to try to show a distinction between what everyone else says and what God says. This is what God commands to be done in the local congregation. And so if we're going to be pleasing to God, then we've got to make a decision. Am I going to do it the way God wants it done? Or am I going to do it the way I want it done? One will be blessed, one will be cursed. When we look to the Bible with a good and honest heart, we will see that God has a plan for the church. It was structured, and he expected us to know that it's real as well as knowable. We've read some passages today that anyone could pick up their Bible and just read it. Don't add anything to it, just read it. It's knowable. We can know how God wants the church structured. And when man deems the word of God as nothing more than a list of ideas or suggestions, he changes the church into nothing more than a social club or a denomination. And so today we seek only to do things the way God commanded. No more and no less. Thank you. To scare me to death. That was four minutes under time. <laughs> we do that. <laughs> Very good, Wayne. Very good. I, I think I've, I've picked up a, maybe a common thread here that we've seen on several instances already. Uh, the phrase, I don't understand. I don't understand why they do these things. I don't understand why they believe these things. And uh, I believe it was John this morning uh, that uh, it may not have the phrase exactly right, but he said something to the tune of people are not scared of logic till logic scares them. And I think they've tossed uh, out logic. So if you go to the scriptures and you apply a little logic, we can figure out what we ought to do. But those folks that we don't understand, they've tossed the logic out. Thank you, Wayne. That was very good. He's put another uh, another brick on the on the the wall of understanding what the church really is and how it is constructed. 